Welcome, this is Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. It's my honor to introduce you to Dr. Willie Hagen. He is the interim president of Cal State Dominguez Hills. Sir, congratulations. Thank you. We're hopeful you get the presidency full time, but that's another conversation. Uh, tell us a bit about Dominguez Hills. Well, Dominguez Hills is one of the uh, 23 CSU schools located in Carson, right. uh, a great city. We have about 15,000 uh, students, uh, mostly, uh, uh, you know, um, more living on campus, you know, commuter school. Right. Um, um, very comprehensive program up to the master's degree. And uh, we serve a, a wide variety of students in the uh, uh, South Bay area. Our service area goes from Palos Verdes, Carson, Compton. And for better or for worse, the campus is known for its soccer stadium. Mm -hmm. I've been on the campus several times because of soccer. My daughters are soccer players. Give us a sense of what the soccer stadium does for the campus, because well, it is quite an attraction. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it's a great facility. You know, it's built by AEG, the Home right. Depot Center. And it is on our property, a long-term lease. And um, we get to use it for some programs, but it, it also allows us to host guests there because of the relationship we have with them. Uh, it brings uh, a lot of folks who wouldn't normally come to the campus, as you've said, and we try to get people who come in, go around, visit the campus, see the campus, and I constantly hear, we didn't know that much about your campus. That was really impressive. So exactly. It's a, it's a magnet, and uh, we're glad to have it. And there. it's a beautiful campus, no doubt. Thank you. I want to talk about your students, because as you suggested, you serve a wide swath of mm -hmm. students, often from areas that are a bit economically challenged. Yes. And so your mission and the school's mission has been to really work towards making sure these students have the greatest chance for success. Exactly. Talk to me about, for example, your bridge program. Okay. Well, the bridge program uh, recognized the fact a lot of students who come out of, you know, uh, poor areas, right. low income areas, or students who are, you know, first generation, don't have a, a, a culture of going to college, they need help. Some of them need help in math, some of them need help in English. Some of them also need help in just understanding, you know, the ropes of higher education. And you've shown me some charts which demonstrate the numbers that need remedial mm -hmm. courses as they enter mm -hmm. into Dominguez Hills, and they're fairly high. Yes. Um, but the point is, is you're not there to let them sink or swim. You're there yeah. to try to help them swim. That's one of the things that attracted me to Dominguez Hills is that our faculty and our staff have demonstrated that they can take these students and they can give them the education, they can give them support, and they can graduate and be as successful as anyone who's gone to any college in the country. And that's important because, you know, um, higher education is still one of the major vehicles for upward mobility. And so in that area, in that community, we meet that need. And as we were saying earlier, it not only transforms the students, it transforms their family, it transforms the community. And, and let's talk about those families because it is true that so often uh, an indication of whether someone will succeed in college is the support they have in their family. Mm -hmm. And if the family is struggling, the child may have more difficulty advancing throughout their college career. The college may not have a lot of control of that family situation. So what can a school like Dominguez Hills, where families may be struggling, mm -hmm. the economy is turning around a bit, but still, I mean, Carson, Compton, these are, these are tough, tough communities. Well, I think that's one of the key things, that we understand that the students who come to us, not all of them, but a good percentage of them, have obstacles that they encounter outside of school that does impact their ability to succeed. So you basically provide, you know, the quality education. But then you provide those things that support the students. Um, advising is critical. Mentoring is critical. Making sure that the student knows that there's someone there that they can go to. And if they don't go to them, they have what they call aggressive uh, intervention. Finding and, the students and staying involved with and them. And we spoke before about the whole notion of self-esteem. Yes. I mean, so much of success, especially for students that may not have had the self-esteem built up mm -hmm. at their high school and their families, it's based upon whether they think they can succeed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So how do you work through that? Well, I think, you know, self-esteem uh, can be shaped by demonstrating students that they can succeed. Right. And so we get the students in and we show them that with a little bit of support, they can do the math. They can do the math and English at the highest level. We're not into lowering expectations or lowering standards. We're saying to the students, this is what you need to accomplish to graduate. You can accomplish that if you put in the work and the time and our job is provide the, the faculty, the staff, and the support that gets you there. And I think that when students see that you know, we care about their success and that we're invested in them and that right. we're just as pleased with their success as they are, and it, that it, helps. It is so important for that student to know that there's someone there that really wants them to succeed. Absolutely. 
we've also seen over the last decade or so that, I mean, it's a blessing and a curse, I guess mm -hmm. one could argue, that female college attendance is on the rise. Yes. Male college attendance is on the decline. And that can, that's a troubling statistic. Right. Uh, the female part we like, right. the male part we don't like. And so Dominguez Hills is looking to target male students to come to college. There are a number of things we're doing. One of the things that we're most proud of is uh, what's called our Male Success Alliance. Um, we have basically brought high school students in and we've worked with them, we've mentored them, and we've showed them sort of the, the path, the way you need to behave to get mm -hmm. to college. We've just established a middle school version of that. We'll be talking mm -hmm. with some of the local superintendents to help identify some of the schools. But we want to take about five, six hundred students, particularly you know, the males, sure. because that's where the dropout occurs. And basically begin working with them, advising them, giving them options uh, from thinking positive about themselves, coming and visiting the campus. Because for a lot and of people- And especially your campus. It absolutely. It is beautiful. Thank you. I mean, there are a lot of campuses that are affiliated with public, the state or whatever yeah. it may be, not so beautiful. Right. Your campus, our, remarkable. Our campus has some uh, spectacular buildings. Right. But like a lot of campuses, we've been suffering in terms of not having the resources to renovate them. Okay. So we're working on that, but uh, we're very proud of the things we have in our and campus. And let's talk about resources. Okay. I would presume that you, as a president of a CSU, you're pleased that Proposition 30 passed. Yes. Is that a fair assessment? I don't want to put Absolutely. words in your mouth. Absolutely. Give us a sense, sir, about why you are pleased as a president of a CSU that the voters were generous enough to pass Prop 30. Well, I think it's very simple. Uh, had Prop 30 fail, the CSU system would have taken a $250 million budget cut. And that would have totaled a billion dollars in budget reduction over the last uh, two years. So avoiding that cut was critical. And then Governor Brown came in and reinvested in higher education. We always can use more, I mean, because we're still down $750 million as a system. Mm -hmm. But the passing of Proposition 30 allows us to sit down now and plan. Um, where do we need to invest the resources that we have? We can't control the politics. We can't control right. the state's fiscal situation. But the dollars that we have, we need to make sure they're focused on our students and our faculty and our staff. And, and the governor did give more money to the CSU system, yes, even in addition to the Prop 30 funds that are flowing in. But it's interesting because part of what he has said is he is looking toward higher education in California to focus more on online mm -hmm. education. That's part of his budget formula. On the one hand, I think that's inspired. On the other hand, I feel like I, I like this. Mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. to be able to talk to mm -hmm. someone. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I'm too old and I just, it's a different generation, but what do you think about that push towards well, online ed? Well, two parts of what you said. Uh, first, let me clarify, Prop 30 did not add any money to our budget. It kept us that from getting another cut. Well stated, and well lot, stated, I knew that's, that. That's important. Right, As it stopped to, the bleeding. Exactly, with regard to online education, online education is here and it has been here. The question is, you know, how much and what formats? And you have, you know, straight online education where students take everything through an online medium. Right. We have hybrid courses, whether it be in a class part-time. You have the MOOC courses now, the massively online open classes. So online education is revolutionizing higher education. Um, and everyone is still trying to figure out what's the best way to do it. Dominguez Hills, and this is you know uh, acknowledged by the system, is one of the leaders in the system in terms of online education. It would we make sense given your population, commuter school, kids are working right. uh, part-time. So you spent 16 years, I believe, at Cal State <coughs> Fullerton. Yes. You spent about six months at Dominguez Hills. Yes. How have you enjoyed your time? Um, I like Dominguez Hills. I mean, right. obviously, um, I spoke to the chance about my coming as interim is because I like the mission, right. I like the students. It's a different like mission than Fullerton. Uh, Fullerton's a pretty established institution. Dominguez Hills, established, but Different populations. Different different populations, but similar issues. Um, you know, all of our schools, and particularly Dominguez Hills, is really about a couple of things. Access. Right. I mean, it was placed there because it's a community that needs access to higher education. As I said earlier, it's a vehicle for upper mobility. But also the question is access to what? So our goal is to make sure that we have a quality education. But then the real key is if they get in, and they have a quality education, right. we've got to make sure they Keep get out and right. they graduate. So those are our focus. His name is Dr. Willie Hagan. He is the interim president of Cal State Dominguez Hills. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Jeff Kellogg. He is a trustee for the Long Beach Community College District. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We'll be right back on Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are now joined by Jeff Kellogg. He's a trustee on the Long Beach Community College District. Sir, I thank you for joining us. Thank you. We just spoke with Dr. Hagen from Cal State Dominguez Hills, and he reminded us that Prop 30 did not provide new money to higher ed, in commu including community colleges. So what did Prop 30 do then for community colleges as an example? Proposition 30, by passing, essentially kept everyone's head right above water right. for one year. Uh, what will take place in the future is still unknown, but at least it did give an infusion of money that will benefit higher education, in particular community colleges, for this next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. After that, all bets are off. But at the same time, Governor Brown has released his proposed budget, mm -hmm. and it does offer, at this stage, about $700 million more for the next fiscal year as compared to this fiscal year. How does that look for that, you? And again, that, that money, though, is to backfill a mm. lot of things that have not been funded in the past. So, uh, but, but at the same time, we have to be very appreciative of Governor Brown for sure. staying true to his commitment to helping fund uh, higher education to the level that he did. That has not been the case in the past few years. And I ask you these questions because there was a lot of confusion as to why Long Beach City College had to cut what we now know is 11 programs, completely drop them. Right. I could see why voters would be confused. We just passed a state sales tax hike. Why do we have to cut programs? Right. And it's a good question, and that's why I, I like the, the media, because I can now <laughs> go back. And But it's a good question, but that's why every time it came up where people would talk about if Prop 30 would pass, uh, I would remind them that it would not solve all our problems that we were still going to be dealing with cuts and the fact with the program discontinuous Long Beach City College, this discussion started over a year ago before even Prop 30 was on the ballot. So let's talk about these programmatic cuts as a microcosm for what's happening at many community colleges mm -hmm. throughout the state. Uh, I understand, I spoke with President Eloy Oakley and he had mentioned when I spoke with him recently that 17 programs had been slated for elimination. Ultimately, the Board of Trustees voted to drop 11. Correct. Talk to us about those decisions. Well, in the process, again, over a year, 23 criteria, going through the academic side of the uh, Long Beach City College Academic Senate, uh, the Planning Council, we got a lot of input from the people that are going to be affected the most. And we came with a list. And, and I want to step back because when we talked about options over a year ago, we looked at other options as well, potentially, uh, for example, taking across the board cuts to all our full-time faculty see. members. That would have given us the savings that we needed. Uh, that the consensus was that they did not want to go that way. So we said, well, then the other option is going to be to take programs, look at them, make a criteria, and that's what we did in the process that worked all the way through finally to the Board of Trustees where Eloy Oakley gave us the recommendations of 12 programs to be discontinued. We actually took one off that was a borderline, and that was with uh, medical imaging. But uh, it was just tough. It was the best of bad situations. And I look at some of the programs, and look, it's easy for me to look on high yeah. and say, why would you cut this? Why would you cut that? But you know, audio production, for example, I mean, it's the 21st century. You it's would think that true. modern technology would, would t want to keep a program no. like that alive. And, and every one of the programs, including hopefully no one that's working the cameras are going to come right. I was going to say, show, but it I, I said this every time we had a discussion over the past few months on this. And I said every one of these programs meet the mission of the college are taught by dedicated faculty members, have a need in the community, but you just have to eventually come down to which area are we going to cut, not ones that aren't doing a good job. And unfortunately, these are the ones that we felt th that meeting all those different criteria, other colleges that could offer the same things, the number of uh, certifications or mm -hmm. diplomas we were giving, these are the ones that were at the bottom of the list. Not that it's a bad list, but, but a list they didn't want to be what's, on. What's also um, frustrating for some is that when you think about the community colleges, I've always thought them to have a dual mission. One, as a two-year incubator before you transfer to a four-year institution. The other, for vocational education. And the list on here, it's a lot of uh, terminal programs, I guess you could say. Yes. Programs where you would graduate from community college and have your degree. So these vocational ed programs, they're being slashed much more quickly. Yes. Uh, and and so, so on there, again, the, the, um, going back to setting up the criteria about looking how many, how many people were we progressing through that were getting a degree. Right. And, and that's what the tough reality is. We're saying, well, these were not performing to the level of other colleges and their programs similar. And, and again, these weren't bad programs. Right. It's just that we had to make that hard choice. If we don't make this one, we still have a $6.4 million deficit that takes you full circle back to, but didn't we pass 
Proposition 30. Right. And yes, it did pass, but that's why we weren't talking about 12 programs and not 17 programs. Let's talk about matriculation to four years, mm -hmm. because as we mentioned, the governor has put together a new proposed budget for fiscal year 13-14. And as part of his increased funding formulas for community colleges, he's looking to link funds to those four-year transfer rates. That's right. And Talk to us about that. And, and, and something that you talked about, the mission with community colleges, also changes that somewhat because before it was community college was about access. And right. You know, people coming in and they can move forward. Now he's looking more at, we want to see results. We want to see the fact you're moving people through to a four-year degree because education is the key for the future of our economy mm -hmm. and the state as general right. the country as a whole. Interesting, now the fact to even say that, that's why also those vocational programs became the list and not English and math right. and those. Exactly. Because the, the shift is now to transfer onto four-year institutions. A and I get that, but at the same time, California still has a need Absolutely. for the trades. Absolutely. And so I, I you know, query whether we are shifting, if the pendulum is swinging too far in it's, the other direction. It's one where th this is the criteria the governor wants to do. This is how funding also is taking place. And what, what I mean about the funding mechanism is tied to, you need to show completions. You need to show results, not just people going to community college to learn uh, painting or conversational Which, Yiddish. Okay, that's fine. That's learners for life. Which I'd like to take, but that's another conversation. But, but that also right. used to be a, a critical component of community college's right. mission. It's now being pushed back, and now you're seeing a change on how community colleges in general in California, Long Beach City College right. at the forefront, on what we're trying to provide to students today. And, and I also think about community colleges. I mean, I remember a time when maybe someone who's retired would take ceramics or conversational Absolutely. Yiddish or that whatever was, it is, but those are gone. Those programs those, are gone. Those are going away because they're not being funded through the state of California but, state legislature. But what about maybe charging more for those? That's interesting. Right. That's exactly what, in that way, the Santa Monica City College talked about I doing. I remember this. Which goes counter to the mission of community colleges, which when I went to Long Beach City College a long time but ago, it was wasn't SMC's free. program to not so much to charge more for the ceramics classes, but kind of a dual track that you could pay more. You could pay more for core subjects right. that they felt that way the students that really couldn't right. afford. Could that died. Have, that died. But, but that, was what, that, that was what they were trying to do to address the needs of how do we get people through our system in a fair way. But what about, and, and maybe LBCC can't do this independently, but what about charging more for the I don't know, the fun classes, it, the, uh, the ceramics or so conversational, you know, Swahili. It, that's, and that's where some of, the, those are some of the great debates that are taking place because the mission for California Community Colleges doesn't really look at it that way, but that is what but I can, believe is going to be the future. Can, that's what's going on. Can LBCC do it itself? Can they charge more for ceramics without I, getting... You need to have state legislation, which oh, we actually do. have had bills, to move to do some of those exact things where certain specific courses you are charging what it costs you to provide right. that the, the people that are going to take those courses are willing to pay. But that's a not only a very controversial it's something that has to work its way through but the legislative process. But it would seem process. if it's clearly a class that's not intended for matriculation, hmm. it's not intended for vocational ed. That was what Long Beach, or Santa Monica, it was the areas of right. English, math, and right. nature. Right. It would seem as if it, it, it's a win-win. Never underestimate, though, the uh, higher education lobbying efforts in the state of California. Education in California reform does not move quickly. And that's been a problem, understanding that it's a remarkable we educate the amount of people we do in the state of California, but at the same time, we have not made the changes fast enough that really needs to address the new generation of learners. Right. The new generation at all ages. Of what we need at everywhere. all ages. And that's a discussion that's going on. That's where some legislation that we are working with to try and get some of those that we can do those things, right. but that still is up for okay. future debate. His name is Jeff Kellogg. He is a member of the Board of Trustees for Long Beach Community College District. My name is Brad Palmer. We'll be right back on Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. The man I'm about to introduce you to is nothing short of inspirational. He reached out to us and I am so glad he did. His name is Brian Gutierrez. He lives in the San Gabriel Valley and as a result of an aunt who loved him more than anyone could ever, he has overcome some real challenges dealing with autism and Asperger's, and he has become a member of California State Council on Developmental Disabilities, a gubernatorial appointment. Congratulations, Thank Brian. You. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we talk about the council, mm -hmm. can we talk about you? Because I think it's so important that people hear and see that a diagnosis of autism or Asperger's is not it's not the end of the world. You can still sur uh, survive and persevere and wind up working for a member of the California State Assembly. Yes. Well, thank you, thank you for having me. Um, and so, yes, um, I, 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 was a, I grew up in um, East Los Angeles. Um, my mom had a drinking problem. Right. I, um, and I also lived with an abusive stepdad. Right. Um, I, I used to get bad grades and while having autism Asperger's. And I didn't have resources or loving parents to care right. for me. And I ended up coasting through elementary school without knowing the importance of education. Um, I later on at 10, I was adopted by my aunt. Uh, my aunt taught me the importance of education and to always advocate and fight for what is right. And uh, within a year, I got um, A's and B's. I went on to uh, go to uh, high school right. at Gallus High School. <coughs> in West Covina. Fight, in West mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I. Um, from there, I, uh, my aunt provided me with resources I needed, therapy, speech therapy, and she showed me that no matter what challenges one person overcomes, no matter if you have a developmental disability, no matter if you come from the foster care system, that if you believe in yourself, then anything and all things are possible. And in a lot of ways, you are quite a miracle, if I may say, because we've heard that without early intervention, it can be very difficult mm -hmm. to treat autism or Asperger's. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow you had the strength of character, the perseverance, the loving aunt, the resources mm -hmm. to just push through. Yes, um, and, I, yeah, I, and I think my aunt and I also think um, the resources the state has right. to take care of those who have developmental disabilities. And that brings us to your appointment. As I said, you've been appointed by the governor through the Senate Rules Committee to the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. Mm -hmm. It's a five-member board. You're one of five. And you know as well as anyone that as a result of severe budget crises, social services have been dramatically cut mm -hmm. over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And while Proposition 30 has passed, um, it doesn't necessarily give new funding, it kind of stops the bleeding, mm -hmm. and we know the governor's proposed budget doesn't really backfill the, the dramatic cuts of the last few years. Mm -hmm. It's a mouthful, but what can you tell us? Yes. Well, the good thing about this year on the revised budget that Governor Brown has issued, the governor has not cut the mental health uh, budget and actually has increased the funding for mental health. Um, one, one of the things I admire about Governor Brown is that he mm -hmm. actually cares about the people of California and he's, um, he's appointing people like myself to be an advocate and I so what? Yeah, so what can you do? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot, but mm -hmm. look, it, you know, these are tough budgetary times, although allegedly we're in the black right now in California, so mm -hmm. amen to that. But yeah, there's only so much money mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of the money is already dedicated through federal programs, through propositions. And so when you have a smaller pot, how do you fight for those dollars, mm -hmm. you know, when the advocacy can be so challenging? Yes, um, and so I think um, the, the budget is, has shrank, right. but there's programs out there still. There are. And um, one of my commitments I made to the governor and to the, the nomination from the Senate Rules mm -hmm. Committee was to be an advocate and to let people know across our state those who are suffering from developmental disabilities and those who are caring, who are parents or caregivers or those, that they know that there's the state of California is out there and that we care for them. And my job will be to ensure that they know the resources that are out there. Um, if you, if people in the audience Google State Please. Council on Developmental Disabilities and scroll over to the resource tab, you'll find out a bunch of information about multiple programs our state offers. And for those who are now aware, there's also one of my responsibilities is the allocation of mental health funding for the regional centers throughout the state of California. Regional centers are a nonprofit uh, federal funded agency mm. 
that deals with uh, those who have developmental disabilities. And I which, urge you- Which is defined as what? What is a developmental disability pursuant to California definition? Uh, developmental disability could consist of someone who has a, um, a, a autism, autism right. um, um, uh, high attention deficit. Oh yeah, yeah, ADHD. A ADHD, right. and I, um, I urge, even if you don't, if you suspect that right. your, your child or someone you know or you love or you care, that you contact the state council or any contact the state council, and I'll be more than happy to assist in any way possible. Is your aunt still with us? Um, she passed away oh. when I was 18, and I um, oh, became I independent. Oh, I'm, I wish she knew that this had happened. But wh if you could talk to your aunt, uh, what would she say? I mean, she, I can't imagine the pride she must feel, even up on high. Um, if I could talk to my uh, aunt. Yeah. Um, I can tell you're, you're tearing up and yeah. I, I, I hope that's okay. Yes. Um, yeah. If I could talk to my aunt, I'll thank her for um, caring for me and teaching me that never to give up. And I, um, she taught me that and I live by her example and I will always help people with the most highest integrity right. as she taught me never to give up and always help those who need the help. So tell me what it felt like for you on February 1st of this year when you received the signed, is it a declaration from the governor saying you had been appointed? Um, I actually received a, a phone call from the governor's office um, saying that the governor had signed my nomination right. and it was a, um, a true, true honor. Someone like myself who came from nothing right. and to have um, the Senate of the state of California right. nominate me and to have the governor approve my nomination was a true honor for me. So you're just starting your term. Talk yes. to me about your goals as you march forward. Uh, my main goal is to be an advocate. Um, part of my responsibilities is to be an advocate and a liaison for those who have developmental disabilities. But my main goal is also to host forums. Right. I think uh, sometimes in government, a lot of concerns we have is the budget cuts. And people are left out of the dark about what programs we still have and those who, that help those who are in need. And I think it will be my job to visit different school districts, different mental health facilities throughout California right. and create awareness and help those who need the help. You mentioned caregivers, and um, I have been a caregiver for my wife who has a physical condition, and she's doing very well. Um, but at least when you have a physical ailment, it's something that you can touch and feel, and there's a diagnosis, and you can take medications. With you know developmental disabilities, it's so hard to touch and feel. Mm -hmm. And so when you go to these forums, what do you say to the caregivers, to your, to your aunt, mm -hmm. for example? Um, I, um, I make sure that they know the symptoms. Sometimes those who have autism Asperger's like myself, there's, you, can't, you can't tell they have them and right. you, it's important to yeah, as I mentioned, get them tested. I would not know. You, know huh? you, you sound terrific, you look me in the eye, the interaction's good. I mean, you've had many therapies as you mentioned, yes. but still. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's important, it's really important that um, if you suspect, and I urge the audience, right. That if you suspect that someone may have a developmental disability, that you contact the state council mm -hmm. because we could refer you to a facility that could do additional testing. And testing includes uh, writing, doing writing samples or blocks. There's different techniques that uh, psychologists use to determine if someone has a developmental disability. So in our final analysis, do you feel as if the future is bright for those that may have developmental disabilities? Yes. No matter if you have a developmental disability, no matter what obstacles you have overcome as a young person or as an older adult that you may be, mm -hmm. that anything you believe in, anything you want in life is always possible if you don't give up. You're inspirational, that's all I can say. I congratulate you on your appointment. You. His name is Brian Gutierrez. He is a member of the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition. Thank <laughs> you.